Okay, we are live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our fifth Pi and AI in Vienna. This is Charlitz from the Vienna Data Science Group, and our speaker, Matthias, already here. Good evening, Matthias. Welcome. Hi. Say hi to everyone. We hi. already have 16 people connected. We expect a bit more. I'll wait one minute before starting with the agenda. And I'll see. As I said, we had overall with the both pages, I think around 100 people registered. So I think, I think some people are lagging here. Where are you, Matthias? So are you sitting in Vienna, yeah? Everyone, yes. no one is allowed to move these days. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. But. All right, so, okay, welcome everyone to our fifth pioneer in Vienna, Austria. This is Thursday, 19th November, and um, today we're gonna proceed like in the past events. Uh, for those of you who already been, been to these events, uh, first I will give a quick introduction of the Vienna Data Science Group because this event is co-organized by Deep Learning and Deep Learning AI and also the Vienna Data Science Group. After that, I will show you the traditional greeting video by Andrew Wang. It's a recording video, sorry. We don't have Andrew Wang live today. Hopefully one day we'll get him. And then we will have our keynotes with our uh, guest for today, Matthias Lechner, who will talk to us about uh, quantization of, of uh, deep learning models. And after the talk, we will have a question and answer session so you will be able to basically post your questions in the chat and I will moderate the session. So let's proceed with our agenda. So as I said, this is co-organized by the Vienna Data Science Group, which is a non-profit organization based in Vienna, Austria, which aims at promoting data science and of course the data scientist. Uh, everyone is free to join. Uh, we organize several events, uh, mostly meetups. There used to be lots of physical events as well, uh, not the last six months, sadly. And we also have a large networks of companies and also collaborations uh, with similar organizations across Europe that work with us and also co-host events uh, together. And if you take a look, uh, if you take a look at our website, we also have a job board. So if your company wants to post a job ad there, we can relay it for you. Or if you're a data scientist or freshly graduated person that has any capabilities in data science and machine learning, you can also check the job board, see if there's anything interesting for you there. We also have a few sponsors that I should mention there, you know, help us financially for, for, a car, for financing some of our operations. So we also have context flow, freedom data, gradient zero, informants, and uh, Unisoftware software plus, uh, thanks to them. There is also one thing I wanted to mention of, I think it's for the people who came to this meetup through the, through the Eventbrite page. Uh, deep learning AI uh, people, even the people, they will contact you um, if you want to fill up a survey. And if you do fill up their survey, they will give you a discount for some of the courses they have on the Coursera online platform. You know that they have been put up several very nice, uh, you know, specialization courses on various topics of, of machine learning and deep learning. So please, um, if you want, if you want to get a discount, just just answer the survey. And it's good because it allows us to get a bit more structured feedback on this event, so that we get better and better at doing this. All right, um, that was for the general introduction of the Vienna Data Science Group. I will show you right now the greeting video by Andrew Ang. Ready? Three, two, one. Hello, deep learners. I'm Andrew Ng, founder of DeepLearning.ai, and I'm excited to welcome you to our global deep learning community. I know that many of you are here today because you want to break into AI and build your career. I hope that being part of this community will help you to do so. To give you a proper welcome, I'd like to show you around the DeepLearning.ai offices and meet some of the teams so that you can see where it all happens. Oh, hi, Andrew. 
Um, do you want to tell our friends at Pine AI what you do at Deep Learning AI? Sure. Hi, everyone. I, I make articles and other media that help people learn about AI and help them understand the huge impact that AI is having in the world. Today, I'm putting together the next issue of The Batch, our weekly newsletter, and I'm looking for the biggest stories of the week to keep our readers informed. What's been the most surprising thing you've run into working on The Batch? How much is going on in this field? There is never a dull moment. I, you know, you might think from the outside that machine learning engineers really understand everything about AI, but nobody understands everything about AI because this field is just coming to life right before my eyes as I put this thing together every week. All right, I know you're really busy, so I'll let you get back to it. Thanks, see you later. Let's go meet Kian, who helped me create the deep learning specialization. He's working on an exciting new project. Hey, Kian. So, do you want to tell the people at Pine AI what you're working on? Yes, sure. Um, I'm leading a project called Workera, uh, focusing on helping uh, people get offers uh, in AI and navigating their career by uh, testing their skills, uh, preparing for interviews and certifying them, as well as uh, matching and referring them to good jobs in AI. That's really cool. And what's the most exciting part of your day? You know, the AI field is new. Uh, organizations and jobs are still misunderstood. So I'm excited to help people understand what different types of jobs exist in the field, uh, what tasks they will work on, and what skills are needed to achieve those tasks. And that's really important work. Well, it's nice chatting. And now let's go chat to Hotel, who is on their product team. Do you want to say hi to our friends at Pine AI and let them know what you're working on? I would love to. Hi everyone. I lead the product team in deeplearning.ai where we create AI education content accessible to people all around the world. People like you. And what are you most excited about right now? I am so excited to see our community grow and to see how eager people are to learn more about AI. Thanks also. So, as you can see, our team is working hard to support you and help you learn. It's never been easier than before to break into AI. So, if you want to build a career, you can leverage online resources available, including open source code, datasets, papers, and online courses like a deep learning specialization on Coursera. As part of this journey, I hope you get your hands dirty too. Don't be afraid of diving in to build your own project or go ahead and try to replicate a research paper that you're excited about. One thing that I've seen help a lot of people succeed is if you can build a community or find a community of fellow deep learners you can meet with and study with on a regular basis. In fact, I hope that this Pine AI meetup that you're at right now will be a good place for you to meet these people. I hope you enjoyed the event today and that you learn a lot both from the talks and from each other. And once again, welcome to the deeplearning.ai community. Thank you much, Andrew. So let's go back to our agenda. So Matthias, uh, you are you are a guest today. So you are you are a, a graduate from the Technical University of Vienna exactly. in computer science, and you are currently doing your PhD at the IST, the Institute of Solar Science and Technology in Kostanovburg, if I'm right, so just next to Vienna. We're one of the top professors for our field, Tom Hatzinger, and there you work on quite a few topics. So interested in robotics, uh, formal verification, and various other topics of machine learning. And especially, you already got a, the opportunity to work on the topic of quantization, which you will uh, talk about uh, to us today. Good. If you are ready, the stage is yours. Okay. Thanks. Uh, just one moment to upload the presentation again uh yeah i will take the time to introduce myself Hi, my name is uh, matthias lechner and as uh already told i'm a phd student at ist austria 
in, in close notebook and uh, working on uh, deep learning uh, in the intersection of robotics and verification, especially in uh, also using machine learning. And yeah, in this talk, uh, we'll hear a bit also about uh, one of my research papers about uh, verification. Uh, but the, most uh, of the talk will be about quantization. Um, so upload is done. Uh, so can you see my slides, Charles? Yes, good, perfect. We can see your slides. You can start. OK, yeah. So the title of my talk is uh, Maximizing Inferencing Efficiency with Model Quantization. And uh, yeah, let's start. We'll start with this uh, tweet by Elon Musk. Uh, which uh, basically says uh, very different computers are needed for training versus inference. FSD, full self-driving chip, is mostly in date, but Dojo is de facto floating point 32. Feels like floating point 32, but it's actually floating point 16 with boring bits truncated. So we don't need to rewrite all the training software. It should work almost immediately. And uh, one um, interesting detail of this tweet is uh, the int 8 here, right? Because the FSD, the full self-driving chip, is that actually runs the neural network uh, on the car, on the Tesla. And uh, according to Elon Musk, it uses only, or it uses 8 bits. And the second uh, detail that's uh, hidden in this tweet is the word uh, mostly. As we'll see later on, it uh, has a lot of implications um, of, of uh, yeah, this little, small little word. Uh, Another example I will show you is the uh, first generation of Google Tensor Processing Unit. Um, here's a block diagram uh, which uh, Google published in this paper that I'm referencing here. And uh, one quote in the paper states that uh, starting in the upper right corner, the matrix multiply unit is the heart of the TPU. It contains 256 times 256 multiply accumulates that can perform 8-bit multiply and add on signed or unsigned integers. So similar to the full self-driving chip, we see in this first generation TPU uh, uses only 8-bit integers for, for uh, yeah, uh, running networks. And finally, uh, also in this uh, latest NVIDIA A100 uh, uh, accelerator, uh, we see that uh, while the uh, floating point uh, performance is really high, we see, for example, half precision performance uh, runs at 312 uh, tera operations per second. But still, the integer performance is twice uh, in terms of 8-bit and even four times as much with uh, integer fear, uh, integer of 4-bit uh, integers. Sorry. So uh, based on these three examples, uh, many companies seem to rely on 8-bit integers for inferencing neural networks. Inferencing means uh, running a network after it's trained. And the question is why? Why is this integers and why 8-bit? And uh, to answer this question, we uh, look at uh, here an NVIDIA paper um, that shows a table of uh, different energy consumption of different operations. For example, the first two rows uh, shows that uh, an integer uh, addition is nine times as energy efficient or costs less eight times less energy than uh, floating point addition. Similar results uh, for floating point and integer multiplication. And the last uh, row also shows, or the last two rows especially show that uh, memory access is very costly. So this gives us uh, one hint of, of why this integer could be interesting. Uh, when we look again at this uh, TPU paper that I referenced before, we have here two quotes. Uh, the first says that 8-bit integer multipliers, so the hardware of doing the multiplication, is six times uh, requires six times less energy running and also six times less silicon area than 16-bit flowing point. For addition, it's even uh, stronger, the difference, uh, where the integer adder takes 13 times less energy and uh, 38 times uh, less silicon area than a floating point. Uh, operation uh, in, in hardware. So basically, from, from these two uh, examples, 
we can summarize that in date arithmetics require less silicon area and therefore we can just put more on, of them on the chip uh, and, and also uh, it requires less energy which means which is important for edge devices or mobile computing devices and or similarly could mean that we can run higher clock speeds and therefore run the network faster and the final point uh, was the memory access which uh, basically when we pack four 8-bit integers into one, uh, we can pack four 8-bit integers into one 32-bit register, which means that we can, each memory access, we can transfer eight variables instead of just one, which means that we have a higher memory throughput, better cache efficiency. And yeah, as we have shown, uh, seen before, memory access is quite uh, energy intense. So yeah, this, this is the reason why, but, but how can we take a model, for example, a floating point network, floating point model, and turn it into an integer model that runs with this uh, efficient hardware, right? And the step uh, from the floating point model to the integer model is called quantization. And the bigger picture uh, of quantization, of turning this uh, floating point into an integer model, is, is from a field of model compression, which tries to reduce the size and uh, runtime impact requirements of uh, neural networks, of trained neural networks. And as I said, quantization is just one of one of several model compression techniques. Another one would be distillation, where you train a student network that's smaller than a, the network uh, by using the output of a larger teacher network as tra a training signal. Uh, another model compression technique is pruning where you remove insignificant weight and uh, insignificant neurons from the network to make it smaller so yeah that's just the bigger picture but again we will focus on quantization yeah so okay it seems that we can when we if we have a, a network in integers running it in integers is much more efficient right in terms of speed and and, and energy and, and silicon area right but how can we run a, a network with integer uh, only operations. And this has to do with uh, floating point versus fixed point arithmetic. So if you think about floating point arithmetic that we use for training and standard running the network, um, it represents each uh, value by one sign bit followed by eight uh, exponent bits followed by uh, 23 uh, fractional bits. And the uh, value that's represented by this uh, binary uh, vector is basically the sine times fraction times two to the power of the exponent. And what it actually does, this floating point format here, the 32 bit floating point, is that it sequences uh, or it, it discretizes actually the real values, which are infinite, but our computer has only finite uh, bits and memory storage. So basically, we put a discretization grid on the real values on the real numbers, right? And uh, yeah, using this format. There's a, a different approach, uh, fixed point, which basically says like when we have a bit string, we just use a certain number of bits to represent the value before the comma and a certain number of, this, of the bits uh, to represent the, the digits after the comma, right? So we have here an example in decimal, actually that's what we use commonly, uh, 0 0.5. Uh, what, what you could use it to represent in binary, just four bits before the comma and four bits after the comma, right? And this does a very similar thing than the, the compared to the floating point. It discretizes the uh, real values, uh, the real numbers, sorry, but it does so differently by by uh, yeah, having a uniform discretization grid. And the advantage of this uh, fixed point arithmetic, uh, fixed point format is the fixed point arithmetic. So uh, integer, uh, sorry, additions, multiplications, and so on. Um, for example, in the case of addition, they can be implemented with just an integer addition, right? So basically, if you represent uh, your number with this in this format, you can just do an integer uh, addition, and you actually do the fixed point representation addition, right? But it's not that simple because uh, we may, as we know, integer uh, addition may result in an overflow. So we need to take that into account for later. Similarly, for the multiplication, uh, simple integer multiplication 
performs the multiplication of the fixed point numbers. Uh, similar to the overflow, we need to take uh, some uh, things into account. For example, the product is twice the bit size as the operands, uh, which means that we need to perform, a, a, again, we have the possibility of an overflow. We need to take care of that. But also uh, rounding, we need to implement the rounding manually, right? Because in the floating point uh, arithmetic, the rounding is already implemented in the hardware. But here we actually need to take care of the rounding and specify how we want to round the numbers. So yeah, it's really, uh, or the, the problem of the, of the fixed point format is really this uh, overflow and rounding behavior, right? And what we do for neural networks, uh, instead of applying this overflow check and the rounding after each operation, we just put it as, uh, we just postpone it to the activation function of a neural, as we will see later. So let's, uh, so then how does this, uh, how does this work? Um, let's, let's put, say we have a, a normal uh, floating point radio neuron here that accept, uh, gets a, a weight vector, uh, input vector X, and basically just sums up, uh, the multiplication of the weights times the inputs, sums this up into a register and then applies the activation function and then returns the value. So not, nothing special here. Um, in, in a quantized uh, radio, for example, uh, one thing that we changed is the floating points to integers. It's we just, uh, what's the motivation, right? To change the floating points to the integers. We also have here additional argument uh, shift uh, that has to do with the rounding, but more on that later. So yeah, the, the inner loop that uh, accumulates or basically computes the neuron value before the activation function looks very similar. But now we need to take care of the bit width. For example, as I said, adding or multiplying two 8-bit integer, integers gives us a 16-bit product. And yeah, we will, uh, so basically we add a lot of 16-bit products and for that we use the 32-bit uh, accumulation registers, right? So yeah, the idea is really, I forgot to mention, the idea is to use for computing a neuron value, the, a larger register, for example, 32-bit, and then do the rounding and the overflow checks afterwards at the activation function. Okay. So the next thing that we do is actually the rounding. And uh, one example would be just to get rid of the last, the least significant bits which is one possible way of rounding, right? Just shifting the accumulation register and shifting out basically the, the least significant bits. There could be potentially different rounding strategies implemented here by looking at the bits that we shifted out and uh, yeah, increasing or decreasing the accumulation register depending on if we want to round up or down. Uh, next thing that we need to uh, do is applying the activation function. Again, uh, here, ReLU, right? Max zero and X, uh, the accumulation variable. And furthermore, we need to take care of the overflow, right? Because we have here a 32-bit accumulation uh, variable, but actually our return value is just eight bits, right? The output of the neuron, the activation is only eight bits. So we need to check if we have an overflow. And in case of an overflow, we just apply, we just clip the value uh, to the maximum possible integer. Uh, yeah. And that's basically uh, how a quantized real neuron looks like. Right? So yeah, so similar, very similar to the, to the floating point uh, uh, neuron, right? But we need to take care of the rounding and the overflow. So yeah, in this loop, we basically iterated over all input uh, items and, and weights and multiplied them in each loop iteration, uh, one item. But for example, here, the, the NVIDIA GPU uh, has special instructions that uh, do four of such multiplications and addition in just one is instruction. So yeah, so basically it takes two or three operands, this instruction, A, B, and C. And it interprets the, the A and B as not just one 32-bit variable, but uh, four 8-bit integers, multiplies them, and then adds them up to the, to the C and assigns them to D, right? 
So uh, when you go back, basically we just, this loop, we basically do for loop iteration in just one instruction. And in such instructions are actually supported also in modern CPUs and other yeah, accelerators to speed up the, the inference speed. So in a nutshell, what we have done, so we can run our network with integer hardware if we use this fixed point format that we uh, that just showed. Um, but we have the cost of uh, lower precision and potential overflows, right? So the lower precision comes from this rounding operations, right? Because we need to have only eight bits. Yeah, and also the potential of overflows. Uh, yeah, that we have in our network that we introduce to our network. So yeah, that sounds very abstract, right? What what does it mean that we are imprecise or that we have this overflow possibility, right? And here's one example from TensorFlow, which uh, uh, from the TensorFlow blog, actually, um, which uh, quantized this mobile nets uh, version one, and you see that it reduces the accuracy of about 1.5 percent. This is already a very good result, actually, uh, in many other uh, type of problems or data sets, uh, you can expect even uh, lower accuracy or a higher drop in accuracy if you if you apply this quantization. So yeah, so are there, is there any technique or what, what can we do if this is really unacceptable? I mean, here it's just 1.5%, which is not that bad, but it could be potentially, depending on the data set, uh, could be much worse. Or maybe even the 1.5% here loss, loss that we have here is too much uh, for us to tolerate. And now we're coming back to the tweet uh, from Elon Musk, uh, where we had this mostly, right? So the full self-driving chip is mostly in date, but not uh, only in date. And yeah, this brings us to our the first technique that we can apply to uh, avoid a loss in accuracy by, by this conversation, by these fixed point representations, is because certain types of layers are extremely sensitive to quantization uh, or to this loss in precision. For example, the first layer or the last layer of a network typically, but also skip or batch num uh, layers uh, could be uh, or tend to be more sensitive. So yeah, the idea is then to just, okay, say, okay, these few layers, we just run with int 16 or floating point, even, even floating point precision, right? For example, the first generation TPU that I just, that I showed before, um, has a 16-bit mode where you can have 16-bit weights or 16-bit activations, which comes, of course, at a reduced speed. But the idea is really that um, because only certain types of layer are sensitive, so for example, the last and the first layer, that we, you run most of the network with in-date. So we, for most of the network, you run with the fast in-date uh, operations. But the input and the output layer, which only take a fraction of the whole computation time, you can use uh, a more precise format. Okay, so this is, yeah. I mean, this this can go even to the extreme case um, where you say like, okay, let's keep the weights, for example, in eight bits, but run all the computation with floating points or even or uh, high precision integers. And so basically you still have an advantage compared to an unquantized network because the, the memory of the weights, the memory transfer uh, is, is more efficient because you can use more bandwidth or the caching, uh, right? So it's also kind of a very weak form of quantization if you only quantize the weights, but keep the computations. There could be also like, as I just said, mixing uh, quantized and non-quantized layers by just saying, okay, the most, the dominant part I quantize, but a few layers I keep. Um, and there's also full integer weights, uh, full quantization, sometimes called. Where, for example, if you uh, run on a first generation TPU or edge device, edge TPU, for example, they, they don't have a floating point unit. And so basically you cannot use float uh, here. So if still, for example, in, you, you have only integer hardware, uh, what, what else can we do to, to reduce this loss in accuracy that I showed before? And one, I, one idea would be to model these effects of quantization already during training so that the network during training can adapt and learn to adapt to its kind of a quantized computation. Yeah, and this is known as quantization-aware training. There's a lot of resources on the internet 
about this. But yeah, so the first part, um, uh, when we have, for example, here a linear or a corn flare uh, followed by a railo, um, I, I mentioned before that yeah, we have this rounding and we have this overflow behavior, right? And one thing uh, that we saw already in the in the implementation of this of this unit, uh, we could we could actually model this overflow behavior as an activation function. So, for example, the relo just clips at the zero, right? But you could have a relo six, which is actually implemented in TensorFlow uh, tf dot nn dot relo six, which clips uh, at the uh, lower value at zero, but also an upper value of six, right? So exactly this overflow behavior is already uh, modeled by the activation function. So basically you just replace the activation function by an upper bounded function and it yeah, basically learns that, okay, there's a maximum value, right? So it's the first step. So this take care, takes care of the overflow, right? I mean, it's not really overflow, it's a clipping, right? Um, I'm calling it overflow. The second part has to do with the rounding, right? And one idea would be to also add this rounding semantics, this rounding behavior of the weights and the activations during training. And uh, this is done uh, by adding so-called fake quantization nodes to the computation graph. That is applied um, after the, uh, yeah, uh, the neuron activation value, but also to the weights. And of what this fake quantization does, is essentially rounding, right? You see here that uh, basically the, the input X is rounded to the nearest uh, uh, discrete value Y, right? But this has a problem, right? Because we, we when you train, we, we apply the back propagation and uh, we compute the gradient, right? So, but if you look at the gradient of this function, it's zero, right, everywhere, right? Because it's a piecewise uh, constant function. So then, uh, came uh, Joshua Bencio with the idea of the straight through gradient estimator, which which basically uh, is the idea of, uh, if you look at this uh, rounding operation here, this conversation, uh, if you had an infinite precision or an infinite bit width, basically, this would approach the identity function. And we know the identity function uh, has a gradient of one. So, I mean, we are not in the, in the, not infinite, right? But we can assume that it behaves similar to the identity function. Right? So we just pretend it's the identity function in the backward path. So you can think of this um, when, when you train the network that uh, for making a prediction, you quantize the weights and activations, okay, during training to predict, for example, here cat, which is wrong. You compute then the error. But then when you back propagate the error and compute the gradient uh, with respect to the weights, you basically remove this. Uh, rounding operations, right? You pretend they were they were never there, right? So this actually doesn't really compute the actual gradient, but it's an approximation. But it performs really well in practice, right? And yeah. So for example, here's another example from the TensorFlow block, uh, which showed that on the right uh, right and most column we see the post training quantization. So just training normally and then quantize. Mm -hmm. And the uh, QAT, which is the quantization aware training model, and the floating point baseline, right? And you see that uh, you you this loss, 1.5% loss in accuracy that I just mentioned, uh, you actually uh, get it back, right? When you do this quantization aware training, right? Similar things with the other networks here. So this is uh, just about the accuracy, right? But there could be other properties of the network. Uh, that changed. And this, uh, now I come to what quantization and all this quantization topic has to do with my research is that we, we looked at the uh, robustness, right? Because we know adversarial uh, networks are vulnerable to adversarial attacks, right? That you change a few pixels of the input and you can fool the network into making a wrong prediction, right? And what we, what we analyzed is how does this robustness change um, with when you apply quantization? So for example, here, the, the simple uh, hello world example of machine learning, the MNIST data set, um, where you have, for example, the uh, uh, floating point network um, and the 8-bit network, and you verify the real the floating point network and show that it's actually robust. There exists no adversarial attack that can attack this image. So basically changing these pixels bit of this image 
uh, will never change the output of the uh, floating point network, but the 8-bit network can be changed, uh, can be fooled basically by this attack, by basically changing a few pixels. So yeah, so basically you can, if you have a robust model, you quantize it, it can be non-robust. But also the other way around, there could be, for example, here is three uh, digit here, that's actually attackable. Uh, so basically there exists an adversarial attack to this image uh, in the in the floating point network, but when you quantize it with eight bits, it's gone, it's robust. And yeah, and a lot of cases where basically a floating point is not robust and also the, uh, so basically the robustness doesn't change with the quantization process. Right. But this needs to also be taken into account that there's, besides accuracy, there's other things that will change, right? Yeah, and I mean, in this research paper here, we, we basically introduced uh, and looked at verification tools for proving robustness of quantized networks. That's why I have been, have been working with quantized networks a bit. Yeah. So this is all like basically the background, what is quantization, why it's needed. And um, uh, also my research. I mean, how? Uh, yeah. But what's 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 more practical, right? I mean, research is research. But if you if you want to uh, train your own quantized quantization aware models, right? You can do that with the TensorFlow Model Optimization Toolkit, which is yeah basically the official uh, TensorFlow repository that has this model compression techniques that I that talked before, right? The, the also pruning, for example, and several tools are uh, implemented uh, very efficiently. For example, yeah, we have the weight clustering, which also tries to get uh, make the weight smaller, the network smaller uh, in terms of weights. We have the quantization, post-training quantization, quantization aware uh, training, also pruning and other toolkits available in, the, in this, uh, TensorFlow TF mod, TensorFlow model optimization toolkit, right? So it's 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 uh, yeah very simple, convenient to use. Um, we have your normal uh, TF Keras model here, for example, and you can quantize it uh, or parts of the model um, with this with this uh, annotation uh, here. Yeah, so basically it's just one function call of making the model quantization aware. Yeah, and then basically what I forgot to mention is like this model uh, optimization toolkit is just making the model quantization aware and 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 uh, or getting rid of, of the synopsis, but this pruning. And then you can export it to TensorFlow Lite and run it, for example, on the on the phone uh, more efficient or this uh, Coral Edge TPU um, in, using this TensorFlow Lite runtime. Yeah. Okay, so much about that. Okay. Good. Thank you very much, Matthias, for the most interesting uh, presentation. There. So, please, to the audience, if you have questions, please post them in the chat, and I will relay them uh, for the moderation of the discussion. There was there was already one question, but I think it's been mostly addressed already by you during the presentation. Like Jill was asking. Like usually when you do pruning uh, models, you have to retrain the model after doing the pruning. So you were showing strategies to basically train the models in a quantization aware fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the exact workflow? I mean, you were showing some hints in the end. So typically you you train your model to be quantized or is there also a workflow where you can train a model with a regular floating point precision, quantize it and then fine tune it afterwards? Yeah, I mean, if you look at this uh, on the on the left side here, right? You just you could, for example, here uh, call model .fit and just train the model, and then you call this uh, quantized model uh, mm -hmm. API, and then you can uh, call model quantized model .fit. Then you basically fine tune a quantization aware. But yeah, actually, it's a good point that most of the time you start training the floating point model, and then you do the only the, the only the fine tuning uh, with quantization aware training. That's I see. A good point, yeah. I see. I think there's another question in the, on the same topic by Dines. He's asking what to be considered when considering vanilla quantization versus quantization aware training. Does it change the outcome, or oh, it's very equivalent? You, you, you mean uh, quantization aware training versus post training quantization, or? I, I guess this is the idea. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, one, one thing that you could just do is uh, basically do a post-training quantization. And, and when you realize that, hey, actually, I see a drop in accuracy, right? Because mm -hmm. I mentioned like this 1.5% 1, 1. loss in mm -hmm. accuracy is not that big, actually. I've seen networks that if you if you quantize them, you, you lose all the accuracy, basically. It's just a random guessing if it's quantized without uh, quantization of a training, right? But you, I mean, usually you do the, 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 the because also like the quantization of a training makes the training a bit more difficult, right? Because of this uh, straight through gradient estimator and so on. So yeah, sometimes it's it's a trade-off, I would say. Yeah. There is some sort of topic about adversarial attacks and the robustness of a quantized model. I think Yelena is asking a question on this. Can you elaborate more on when can it happen that we or with organization the network is prone to adversarial attacks? So basically, can you predict exactly how how the quantization will affect the robustness of the model? And do you have specific experience to 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 relate practical practical experience of that? Uh, what can go bad? Oh, okay. I mean, <laughs> practically, experiments is or 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 I would say that you can expect most neural networks to be vulnerable to adversarial attacks, right? If you don't train it with adversarial uh, uh, adversarial training, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, the the only thing is that that can happen with the quantization is that it, it some of these uh, uh, vulnerabilities uh, go away, but others pop up basically, right? So basically, mm -hmm. you you change it a bit. But I, th I, I think it's it's it will be there, right? It was there before; it will be there afterwards, right? And yeah, so so the only way of getting rid of this is really quantization. Uh, uh, sorry, adversarial training, right? And other other techniques. I mean, there's it's still a active research area of, of making sure the networks are fast. Mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting. So that's a question that I had. Uh, I, I mean, the topic of quantization, generally speaking, computer science that that's an old that's an old topic. But I wanted to ask you about quantization. So for deep learning models, uh, is it still a very active research topic? And what are the current directions, uh, the main directions on, on that field? Well, that's a that's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the the I basically the way I talked about this is very high level, right? I mean the mm -hmm. Uh, basically, the, the mapping of how you translate. Uh, so basically, at this fixed point format I was mentioning before, you need mm -hmm. to specify where's the, the decimal point, right? Or where's the, the point, right? Where do you, how many bits you use before and after the comma, right? And this could be different for each neuron. Each neuron could be have a different flow, uh, fixed point format, right? Mm -hmm. And all of this, uh, there was a lot of uh, heuristics developed of getting rid of uh, or, or deciding where to put the, the fixed point, uh, where to put the point basically of each neuron, right? And and the, the things that are implemented in this TensorFlow model optimization toolkit, they are already very, very advanced. So they, they for example, they use uh, profiling, right? Where you have to specify uh, so a typical input samples. And based on this typically uh, typical activations, uh, the, the quantization scheme, the fixed point format is chosen then for each neuron according to this um, profiled uh, activations, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's also like uh, during training, uh, mm -hmm. also like learning, not just after the after, after the training, there's the conversation where to put the fixed one, but also during training, how can you optimize the fixed point format in order to minimize the loss, right? All of this is really like research topics. And the, the, yeah, as I said, like the techniques implemented in this model optimization toolkit are really like uh, the, mo the, the very advanced techniques. Yeah. I see, good to hear. So there's a lot of room left for lots of papers and a PhD thesis on the topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I might ask you, will the, the PhD thesis, the, the final, the fi your final PhD thesis will be on quantization specifically or it'll be broader than that? No, oh, broader, yeah, broader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is just, uh, it was not studied before this uh, how the how the quantization affects the robustness, right? And then yeah, so mm -hmm. it was a, a, a simple and easy topic to to or, or paper to 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 work on, right? But there's yeah. a comment. There's a comment from Jules Alsinger. He says, "Oh, this sounds like the different heuristic used for neural pruning." The the quantization. Uh, yeah, do you, do you recommend that? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, they, 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 they use a lot of heuristics, right? How to, how to optimize the, the fixed point format. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so, so the point is really that the, the ones that are implemented here in this quant, uh, model optimization tool are not the simplest, but they're already very complex. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, I agree that on, on, on pruning, it's very similar or even worse. Maybe there's a lot of different, uh, strategies and, and heuristics of how, what neurons and what connections to prune. Mm -hmm. There is a question slash comment by Benedict, but I think it was already answered during a talk. Where is the biggest gain from model quantization? Is it inference speed, energy efficiency, something else? It's all of it, no? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's all of it, basically. <laughs> right? I mean, the, the, the chips are easier to uh, yeah, you can you can use simpler chips, right? Because the floating point hardware actually you have this because you have this uh, format of this exponent and then the fraction. You need when you add or multiply two variables, you need to normalize them such that they're in the same format. Then you can apply the the uh, operation, and then you need to renormalize it, right? Because maybe a lot of zeros are removed or something, right? And all of these steps are really uh, not there in the integer, right? Domain, uh, yeah. Uh, there's a question from my side. Uh, we see that a TensorFlow only supports a limited number of operations for uh, quantized uh, for quantification, quantization. Sorry, do you do you know why? What's the answer to that? Um, quantization. Uh, what do you mean, like by in, if you do then the TensorFlow light exporting or or uh, they they have a list on their documentation of operation they support. Assuming they don't support other operations. Yeah, yeah. No. So they support basic operations that you need for you know, mobile net, ResNet, but maybe not not more, you know, exotic layers. Uh, for it. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Especially if you if you define your own layer, you need to also specify how it's quantized, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think the for for vision, it's not a problem, right? All of this kind of max pooling. I mean, max pooling is simple, right? But uh, convolution, one D convolution, I think all of these standard tools uh, have quantization, uh, a, a quantization mode implemented, right? But yeah, you're right that there's some exotic <laughs> things that that yeah that they uh, are not supported by quantization. Yeah. There's another question by Elena on the topic of overfitting. She said, she said, I would think that the benefits are so less overfitting and does the model working better with previously unseen data? What is your view on this? Well, um, that's a, that's a tough question, I would say. Yeah. And yeah. so it's not straightforward that this prevents overfitting. Yeah, I would not. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can still overfit the model, right? Yeah, you can, you can still very easily overfit, right? But yeah, if you if you think about the capacity, right? Because you only have eight bits, so basically you you reduce a bit of the capacity, of course, yeah. So basically, yeah. But but yeah, I think the problem doesn't go away, right? Okay, there's another question from Jules, who seems to be a, a great friend of pruning. She's so asking, what should you expect from the different compression method, like you know, pruning, quantization, etc. Uh, if you combine them together, uh, do you get do you get do you get really better accuracy by combining them, or is it exponentially harder to get a good accuracy? Yeah, I think it's uh, there. Are... If you if you apply one, it's fine, but if you apply Two, for example, at the same time, maybe the, the accuracy will drop to a catastrophic level. I mean, it also depends on, for example, what your hardware is is like optimized. For example, um, the, the the latest is uh, A100 TP, uh, uh, sorry, GPU from from NVIDIA. They have a special support for sparse networks, right? Mm -hmm. if, because uh, like this pruning stuff, um, because all of this. Uh, 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 hard uh, multiplication algorithms expect dense uh, version, right? And they're really optimized of that you have a dense uh, kernel and a dense uh, yeah computation. So really, this this sparsity was not really it, it is a cool technique, right? But it was not really used that much. But now with the support of of of, of the Nvidia GPU of having sparse networks, I think we'll see also an increase on 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 the sparse mm -hmm. network. But in a different scenario, it could, for example, be that. 
um, you you have, uh, for example, an edge TPU or I you know the, your hardware only supports integers, then of course you have to use this uh, quantization, right, instead of the other techniques. But on, on the other hand, like even this distillation, right, in the, the, the natural language processing domain, there's this distill this paired, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it's, I think, in, in this natural language, because for the transformers, maybe it's not really, uh, them, like the, the experience with quantization of transformers is not really strong. So that's why they, they, they used, for example, distillation, right? Because it's, you can always apply, the, or in most cases, you can apply distillation. Hmm. Good. I see no more questions from the audience. Uh, please keep posting if you have anything you want to ask. Uh, and we would like to zoom out a bit. On, uh, I have a bit more more general general questions on, on some research and what 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 are you doing? Uh, I mean, you mentioned that uh, you were you were working on your paper was on verification for verification. Could you explain in maybe not too technical way what is formal verification and how does it work about when uh, when it comes to deep learning? Okay, yeah, sure. I mean, the the, the best example is this, this is adversarial robustness, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, if you you want to be sure that your model is not vulnerable to adversarial attacks, right? Because it's it's weird, it's not natural, right? So so. What you could do is just, but how do you check? How do you, how, you, how do you make sure that your model is robust, right? If you just check your model with, with gradient descent, right? Uh, maybe uh, you missed it, right? Mm. Uh, because there's a lot of defenses actually published uh, for, for, for robustness that basically just make the gradient descent work really poorly, right? But they, they never, Make sure that it's really robust, right? You know, maybe your gradient descent initial value was just bad, right? Mm -hmm. but this verification really tries to say, okay, can we? How can we prove, formally prove, that no attack exists, right? So, uh, for example, at, uh, when you say attack, uh, we mean, of course, uh, bounded attack. So basically, you're allowed to change each pixel up to a certain, like, increase it or decrease it up to a certain magnitude, right? Mm -hmm. And then basically having a proof that. It doesn't matter how you change the pixel a bit, you will never change the output prediction of the network, right? And really, there's a hard problem, right? Because you, yeah, there's a lot of combinations that you need to check. And, but these, these tools or these fabrication methods, they try to not enumerate all these combinations, but they do smart things of, yeah, saying, yeah, okay, this, this neuron here is linear. So at least, uh, the whole, uh, basically not just one, one sample, but the whole region, like, is, is, should be robust, right? Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, really, I mean, for verification, it's really about making sure uh, you your model fulfills this robust specification, right? Mm -hmm. But not with just, I, I couldn't find one attack, but really there exists no attack, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you much for the answers. I don't know, there's still a few minutes left and uh, I have the normal questions about this talk physically for the others. Also, while we have you, I was curious about a few things because, you know, a, a few a few months back, actually for the first session of this Pioneer, we had your colleague and I think friend, mm -hmm. uh, Ramin Asani, yeah. who was presenting to us the liquid continuous time uh, recurrent neural nets. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very interesting talk. Uh, you you were also, you were also working on that with him, and uh, I wanted to know what is the status of the the publication presentation, or I keep working on that. What's happening around around these models? I mean, there, there's a. Uh, so how 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 long was this ago? <laughs> uh, well, I think it was in September. I think August or September. Uh, okay, see. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we published a paper at uh, Nature Machine Intelligence, uh, I think in September or October, October, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, especially, uh, the, this, um, I'm not sure if you showed a video of this driving. Um, uh, yeah, you showed the radio talk, didn't share the slides afterwards because it was still under review at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it, so basically, I mean, this is, has to do with sparsity, right? It's also compression, but on a different, uh, it's it's basically then the, these networks, right? These LTC networks are sparse, right? From design, instead of just pruning afterwards, you already say, okay, we want to train with a sparse network from the beginning, 
right? Mm -hmm. And we, we use this different model that is um, yeah, more complex, but uh, maybe has a lot of nice properties. And we, we, we showed it for, for this autonomous driving uh, with the colleagues, with our colleagues from MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, where we actually connected the, the, the network to a, to a real car and it, it showed that you can steer uh, better than a than feed forward network, right? Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, we have this memory concept. So, yeah, I, I, we have published this paper, yeah, it, it's, and, yeah, got so far very nice feedback. Yeah. And I think also the liquid city airlines were about to be integrated in Keras. What's the status of that integration? Yeah, there's a there's a there's a, a PIP uh, repository, uh, yeah, repository, uh, mm -hmm. Keras NCP. Mm -hmm. So basically, you can just PIP install the the LTC model basically on the yeah, NCP. This this sparsity from the beginning, right? Yeah. So also here is, we have done some publications. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, thank you. It was good to do a little bit follow up on this topic here uh, during this 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 session. All right, I think we're good for today, uh, Matthias. Really, thank you much for, Thanks, for, yeah. for coming in this talk. Thank you for the yeah. questions. Thank you to the audience for attending and asking very interesting questions. Yes, uh, Jules, okay. Yes, I was right, Jules uh, Salsinger. You were doing your master thesis on pruning algorithm. Okay, mm, okay. hence your questions. That explains a lot of things. All right, good. So everyone, have a good evening. Thank you for attending and just stay tuned. There will be more events. I'm not sure if there will be one in December, but uh, for sure next year. All right. Thank you much. Thanks. Goodbye.